Hi, and thanks for joining us at Lenaro Virtual Connect 2021 um, for this talk on the Secure Telemetry Pipeline. My name is Kevin Townsend. I'm a senior embedded engineer in the Vertical Technologies Group. Uh, my main focus is on very small, uh, low power embedded devices generally. Um, that means ARM Cortex M class. And in this talk, uh, we'll, be, we'll be going over sort of a proof of concept that we've been working on called um, Tentatively Step. So we'll get into some details specifically of what step is, but um, just to sort of set the, the, the background, the proof of concept of step is, is based um, at present on Zephyr RTOS, and it's implemented specifically as a Zephyr module and written in C. One of the benefits of, of basing this on Zephyr for the proof of concept is that you can run uh, basically everything that we'll discuss in this demo purely in QEMU. Um, and it should be fairly easy to take uh, any of the material discussed in this in, in this talk and in this proof of concept and port that over later um, to other RTOSs. So the link to the specific GitHub repo is, is listed there. Um, that may or may not change in, in, in the future. Uh, again, this is just a proof of concept, but um, that'll sort of give you access to the, the, the current state of affairs with the source code. So why step? Um, why do we need yet another software framework for dealing with sensor or telemetry data? Good question. Well, embedded devices tend to be very centered on sensor data specifically. That's generally one of their main roles, um, is, is often dealing with telemetry data, uh, processing it, and inferring some sort of information with that data, and then taking specific actions. There are a lot of, of sensor APIs and SDKs and telemetry frameworks out there. Um, Zephyr, for example, has its own sensor API, which uh, has, has various pros and cons about it and, and certain design, design decisions that were made um, by the people writing that. Um, with STEP, I think we, we've, we've tried to set out a certain set of goals, for example, that a lot of IoT telemetry frameworks, they lip service to the idea that IoT devices are resource constrained. But in reality, very few of them actually provide a mechanism to represent data um, very concisely. So one of the biggest requirements for us was just to be able to represent telemetry data in a genuinely concise um, manner to get the, the most efficient use of embedded resources um, possible. Another key requirement is representing data unambiguously. Um, as anyone who's written drivers and dealt with sensor data sheets and the various lies and misrepresentations and omissions that exist there, data is rarely unambiguous and, and we're often given facts and figures and we have to fill in the fill in some of the blanks. So one of the design goals with STEP is obviously to be able to precisely and, and, and unambiguously represent data. So in this case, what does that mean? It means using very clear and specific SI units for each sensor type, clearly representing the scale of those of those SI units. Um, and also something that's often neglected is that even if you have a framework that, per, that, that precisely identifies the SI unit and the scale, there's often no room to maneuver about the, the, the underlying representation and memory of that SI unit and scale in, in, in a C type. For example, maybe that's a 16-bit float, maybe that's a double precision 64-bit float, maybe that's a signed 16-bit integer or an unsigned 32-bit integer. Um, there's obviously a need maybe to, to, to have um, a specific SI unit and scale, but also to, to have some sort of maneuverability about how we represent those, those SI units and scales in, in C types in memory specifically. Um, so that's something we've, we've really tried hard to, to address. Um, coming up with yet another telemetry data framework is, is sort of fill in some of these gaps that haven't necessarily been there with other frameworks. Obviously, part of that unambiguous representation of data is, is just a, a goal of being able to represent data as precisely as possible with the limited number of bits and bytes that we have. So, for example, by, by, by providing a means to be able to adjust the scale of the SI unit up or down, we can get sort of the most data um, in a limited range, like a 16-bit float or, 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 or even an 8-bit integer. Um, so, if we have a very weak signal, then we can adjust the scale of that SI unit just to be able to get the most efficient use of the limited storage space uh, that, that we have and, and very precisely represent the, 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 the telemetry sample. Obviously, we don't want to paint ourselves into a corner with some sort of framework either, so it's very important that telemetry data can be represented 
generically that there's a lot of room and flexibility in the future to take into account certain classes of sensors that we, we, we haven't identified early on. Um, so you want something that is, is concise, but that has room to grow, uh, in a sense, to, to cover uh, unforeseen or, or unexpected use cases in the future. And uh, it, it's just a given that, that things are going to be thrown at any sort of system that weren't anticipated early on. So to try to build in a bit of flexibility and, and a bit of extensibility to the way the telemetry data is, is represented, and that, that's obviously one of, the, one of the big goals that we've had here. So the representation of telemetry data is one of the two pillars um, that this sort of step is built upon, um, and something I'm sure we can all relate to. The other big pillar in, in any sort of telemetry system is obviously data processing, is now that we have the data represented, how do we do anything useful with it? How do we interpret and transform that data and take specific actions based upon that data? Um, and there's some, some very specific data processing requirements that we, we, we've tried to take into account coming up with STEP as, as a framework. So obviously nobody's life is getting any easier today in, in terms of telemetry and embedded systems, as specifically the, at least the firmware authors. Um, there, there's a lot of moving pieces today that we need to take into consideration. Uh, not just sort of simple classic problems like sensor fusion, um, DSP filtering, etc., but more and more things are, are, are relying on artificial intelligence and machine learning and various inference engines and, and, and tools to take those raw telemetry inputs, run it through an inference engine, and get out actionable outputs from that. And sort of the, the, the algorithms um, that, that we sort of would traditionally use aren't always up to the task with the very complex requirements we have today, pulling things out, of, pulling data out of the noise, etc. So um, nobody's life is, is really getting easier in addition to sort of AI ML, which was a big driver of this idea of, of step the proof of concept. There's also increasingly um, a concern, obviously a valid concern, about security in embedded devices, not just sort of high level security of protecting your firmware, but uh, security of protecting the data inside the firmware that, that, that maybe you want to limit who has access to that, that those sort of raw sensor inputs that can be highly sensitive if you're dealing with biometrics, etc. So there's also a lot of security concerns that you need to ensure the integrity of, 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 of your, 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 your measurement data, the provenance of your data, that it's coming from the device that you think it is. Um, who has access even on the device itself to that data if it's ever exposed outside of maybe a secure processing environment if, if it's highly sensitive data um, whether you need to encrypt and decrypt that data all of this with very limited resources so there are very complex workflows today in modern embedded systems to deal with telemetry and measurement data to take those those, those raw inputs clean them up feed them into maybe an inference engine secure the data during that, 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 that process and, and, and get your actionable, actionable information out. And this is very much where the P in step comes from, this idea of a pipeline. And what we've tried very hard to, to do is come up with a system where you have all of these operations and we've tried to come up with sort of a node-based workflow so that we can decompose all of these individual operations into logical chunks that can be reused and reorganized and maybe reconfigured uh, entirely at runtime. And so that you can deal maybe with one type of measurement or telemetry input one way with a specific pipeline and have another flexible pipeline for a different type of data or maybe with, uh, with a different device state, process that differently and be able to, to make all these changes and recompose this pipeline um, and at runtime, not just at build time. And we'll, we'll dig into that in a minute, but um, I, I think just that introducing a lot more flexibility than has traditionally been there to define your complex workflows and, and your telemetry data pipelines is, is something that's been sorely missing for, for, for a lot of people for a long time. Sorry, that's been a, a 10 minute introduction and we're only on slide number two here, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to move this forward a bit. So basically, STEP as a proof of concept as it exists today is trying to essentially address these two key problems. Number one, representing measurement data efficiently, unambiguously, and precisely in a way that's appropriate for small embedded systems and implementing a node-based pipeline for asynchronous processing of measurement data. And if you're not familiar with node-based processing, it's not, it's not a big deal. Hopefully that will be clear here, but it's, it's a, it's a well-used sort of model that's easy to look up on Wikipedia. Um, so some of the specific things in step, before I give you just sort of a quick uh, visual overview of how it works, is that uh, 
you, you, you have a concept called processor nodes. And these nodes are the individual operations. Now that might be hashing, that might be signing, that might be encryption, that might be your inference engine, that might be basic DSP operations. So you have these processor nodes and individual nodes, or they're like miniature applications almost, they can be chained together into something called a processor node chain. And then you have a sort of a sequ sequential operation of nodes where you have at the top of this node chain, um, your telemetry data is passed in and it will run through a series of operations and then you'll get sort of the output at the end of that chain. Um, and so you, you can have just a single processor node if you want, but a lot of the flexibility from STEP is going to come from this idea of processor node chains. Um, so all of these nodes or node chains are registered into something called a node registry, which is sort of a software component that just keeps track of which nodes exist um, which measurements those those nodes or node chains care about, uh, and whether the, those those nodes or node chains are currently enabled or disabled, etc. So registered nodes or node chains fire something fire based on something called a filter match. Basically, every measurement, every every chunk of telemetry data in step has a specific 32-bit um, filter word that's part of its uh, of, of the measurement header that we can use to indicate whether a node or a node chain cares about that, that, that measurement. And if there's a filter match, um, then that node or node chain will process that specific measurement. If not, it will just keep going through the registry until it finds something that does match. If there's no matches, the memory will just be freed, as, as we'll see uh, in, in a minute or two. Um, and obviously, the, 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 the useful thing here is that once you implement one of these specialty processing nodes, it's very easy to reuse later with very minimal um, uh, sort of system resource requirements to reuse that. Um, and the, there, there, there's an intentional effort, obviously, to reduce the number, the amount of mem copy operations, et cetera, which hopefully you'll see. And that happens through something, through, through, an, op through an optional memory allocation mechanism um, called the, 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 the sample pool. And rather than just sort of talking for another five minutes, why don't I, I'll, I'll give you a quick sort of visual overview of, of, of um, step as a proof of concept and basically how it exists today with this concept of measurements um, of the sample pool which is basically the software mechanism that manages um, sort of the, the the allocation and the the, the buffering of, of telemetry data that will be processed and then the processor uh, processing engine which basically takes samples asynchronously out of the sample pool, process them, processes them, and then when that's done, that will re, 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 um, deallocate the sort of the memory from the, the sample pool's heap. So STEP doesn't attempt to replace, for example, the Zephyr sensor um, API. Um, everything starts with the premise of a sensor driver or some sort of driver or data, data source. It doesn't necessarily have to be a sensor, but some sort of uh, telemetry data anyway. That driver will need to allocate some specific memory um, and it, it, can, it can allocate that memory on its own if it wants but generally in the same, for the sake of efficiency um, we would recommend that you use the sample pools built-in heap memory. So basically how this would work is you have your driver which will request from the sample pool a measurement to be allocated from the heap and you're going to tell the sample pool exactly how large that measurement should be. Say that I, I need a 64 byte payload or a, a, a 512 byte payload or a 4 byte payload and the sample pool will give you back a an empty measurement that was allocated from that uh, from, from the heap. The driver then will take that allocated measurement sample, fill it with specific data and then when it's done populating the, 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 the measurement sample with the telemetry data it will, it will queue that, that measurement in, in the sample pool's FIFO buffer. At this point, the processor node manager comes into play where we'll asynchronously check the sample pool's FIFO buffer for new measurements. And if any measurements are found, it will, it will pull out the oldest measurement from the FIFO and start to process that by running it through the processor node registry. Each one of these columns represents a node or a node chain that has been registered in the node manager's registry. Now, each one of these um, records in the registry can have one or more filters that are attached to the top of the node chain. And that filter value or that set of filter values, which can have Boolean um, 
logic operators like or, and, is, not, etc. Those will be evaluated against the filter value that the incoming measurement contains. And if there's a match between the measurements filter and the filter chain that is associated with that, um, that, that node or node chain in the registry, then that measurement will be processed by that, that specific node chain. Keep in mind that these operations are destructive. So um, as the measurement is passed through the node chain, you're operating on the same instance of the measurement. So you need to be careful which order that you, you, you place these, these operations in, and also that you allocate enough memory at the beginning of the process to cover all of the memory, requir memory requirements of the processor node chain. So once we get to the end of a specific node or node chain, we just continue um, through the rest of the registry and check if, if there's a filter match against our measurement and that specific uh, registered uh, filter uh, node or node chain. Um, once we get to the end of the entire process, of uh, the measurement has gone through the entire registry. Basically, if the, the, the measurement was allocated from the heap, it simply goes back to the heap to be deallocated, and uh, we, we sort of go through this loop endlessly. So hopefully that's given you a good introduction, basically a high-level overview of, of how STEP is organized, what we're trying to accomplish with it, and sort of the basic processing workflow. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, so I'll very quickly try to go through some of the specific technical details of um, how measurements, um, how telemetry data is represented in memory, um, because I think it's an important thing to understand and is a key part of the system. And we'll also try to give a quick overview of, of how uh, sort of processor nodes are defined. Um, but you're, you're realistically, if you're interested in this, you're better off going to the GitHub repository and really digging into some of the source code there for some of the specific technical details. So measurements are represented with a 12-byte header with an optional extra four bytes or, or eight bytes for a timestamp if that's required, um, followed by the actual payload itself. Um, now, having a 12-byte header might seem like the opposite of uh, the efficiency and, and, and sort of the concise nature of, of step that we sort of talked about before. Um, and 12 bytes definitely isn't nothing in, in, in an embedded system. But do keep in mind that this header can represent um, more than one sample at a time in the payload. Uh, which is why we have up to a, a 64 kilobyte payload and even those payloads can be chained together. So there is some overhead obviously in representing telemetry data with the SI units etc and these three key um, words in the header the filter word, the unit type and scale word and the source and length word um, those you, you, you can reuse, re reuse those for sort of maximum um, efficiency in terms of memory consumption with step. The filter word is one of the most important in that it's going to determine which processor nodes um, can deal with your, your specific measurement. So it consists of three parts. There's an 8-bit base measurement type, an 8-bit extended measurement type, and then 16 bits of flags, which we'll dig into in a minute. So measurements are classified based on two 8-bit values. Every measurement has sort of a high-level base measurement type, and this is things like acceleration, energy, light, mass, time, velocity, uh, magnetic field, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this gives you sort of a very generic group with a specific default SI uh, unit and type. These base types can then be specialized using a secondary 8-bit field called the extended uh, measurement type. And this allows you to, to express uh, far more precise um, types of telemetry data or, or measurements. For example, if we take the, the light measurement, um, the light base measurement type, uh, we can specialize the default value for light into things like uh, for radiometric units, uh, radiant flux, irradiance, or for photometric units, uh, luminous flux, luminous intensity, illuminance, etc. And each of those um, combined base plus extended types can have their own SI units and scale and default values. So this allows you to represent data generically or in very precise terms and it gives you a certain amount of flexibility um, and it's relatively easy to extend and so with 16 bits of data we can have an extremely rich representation of telemetry data without painting ourselves into a corner unnecessarily. The flags half word contains um, a lot of the key metadata about the contents of the measurement itself um, and the reason that this is contained in the flags word is that these are sort of critical values to determine um, a filter match based on, for example, if, if I only care about uh, 
whether a sample is compressed or not compressed, whether it's in encoded uh, or not, whether there's a specific data format used or not, whether there's a timestamp present or not. Um, all of that information is, is sort of contained in these 16 bits uh, of, of flag data, and those will tend to change as your measurement goes through the processor pipeline. Um, but it's, it's important to be able to filter on, on these, these specific values. We don't have the time to really dig into a lot of the sort of the, the details of these flags. And again, look at the GitHub repository if, if you really want to see some more technical details. But this hopefully sort of demonstrates that we've tried to keep step as flexible as possible and to account for as many sort of scenarios as possible, such as um, maybe the data should is just represented as, as raw floats, uh, floating point values in, in the payload. However, there are situations where maybe the data needs to be um, put into a specific data format like CBOR. Um, and obviously, once you start to uh, place your, your, your raw data into CBOR format, then you gain access to things like COS, so you can have message authentication and, and sort of a, a well-defined security protocol. Um, so we try to stay as neutral as possible about what the actual payload contains and, and to make that extensible. Um, additionally, things like uh, encoding just to have some sort of mechanism to be able to encode messages as say like base 64, um, or maybe it's a bit more obscure, but base 45, which allows you to encode data into an even further reduced character set for representation in say a QR code or something like that. Um, there are cases where you'll want to be able to compress or not compress uh, the, the, the data and, and, and look at the trade-offs there. So we, 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 we try to sort of account for some of those requirements um, in modern, embedded devices where you might have to compress the, 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 the payload before it, it goes off the device. If you're talking about um, sort of personal information like fingerprints, uh, for example, that, that, can, that can maybe get uh, quite large or, or, or minimal audio samples where you might need to compress that to, to efficiently transmit it. So by exposing the base type, the extended type, and the 16-bit flags um, in the, the filter field, you can see why we can get quite rich uh, filter matching capabilities with just the single 32-bit word. So for example, if I, if I want to define a processor chain that only cares about um, temperature data where the extended type is either the die temperature or the ambient temperature and the data is encoded in CBOR format and there is a timestamp included that's either 32-bit uh, millisecond uptime or 64-bit millisecond uptime. We can very easily define all of that just comparing to 32-bit values very efficiently. All right, we're short on time here, but I'm going to try to fly through this. So the next word um, is the unit type and scale, and this is where we're going to represent the SI unit type, which is a 16-bit value, the scale factor, which is optional and is an 8-bit value that allows you to shift the default um, SI unit scale up or down, and then the C type, which is how that SI unit is represented in memory. Um, and again, have a look at GitHub for some details here, but we'll just sort of quickly skim through this. So very quickly, the final uh, mandatory 32-bit word is the source ID and length. And this is going to give us the 16-bit payload length. It also defines some, some other fields um, that help us understand how many specific samples are represented in, in this individual measurement. And again, this comes back to trying to be efficient, uh, make efficient use of memory. So we can indicate if this is a fragment, for example, if this specific payload, 64 byte, a uh, 64 kilobyte payload is one of multiple payloads that should be assembled on, on the receiving end, um, whether this uh, specific measurement is actually a vector um, so does it have just a single data point or does it consist of two, three or four data points if we want to represent, for example, a quaternion or an accelerometer triplet? Um, and an additional flag to indicate the number of samples that are represented inside this payload. There's also an optional source ID flag, which is an 8-bit field, which you can use to correlate a specific sensor instance with this measurement. For example, if we're logging the data in some sort of um, data management system, we might want to be able to correlate it back to a sensor that has a specific ID so that we know what type of sensor generated this data. And there, there has to be some out-of-band information transmitted in that case, but there is an 8-bit mechanism to be able to correlate measurement data with the drivers or the, the, the sources that, 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 that produced that measurement initially on the specific device. So timestamps are optional and largely self-explanatory. Self 
Um, there are a few mechanisms to, to display timestamps, whether that's epoch time or uptime, etc., and, and that can be extended in the future. But there are various mechanisms to represent the timestamp of the measurement sample. So the payload can actually be quite flexible with step. Um, and again, look at, the, look, look at some of the source code to, to, to understand the current state of affairs. Um, but the exact contents of the payload is going to depend and vary based on the, the, the different flags uh, that, that, are, that are set. And we've tried to allow the, the, the payload to be as flexible as, as possible. Um, the important thing in step is more the metadata that's represented in the header itself. So that brings us uh, finally to processor nodes. And processor nodes are really the workhorse of, uh, of step. Um, you should really think of them as basically mini applications that act upon the measurement data, which we've just spent maybe more time than I should have describing. Um, so processor nodes, uh, which you can obviously chain together um, in, in sort of a, a predefined pre um, uh, order, they, they allow you to encapsulate and reuse specific processing log logic. And this, this will be things like filtering, hashing, etc. Um, so you can take these sort of primitive operations, encapsulate them into specific nodes, and, and very easily reuse those. Um, and so nodes themselves uh, are, are, are based on basically a, a series of callbacks that, that every node will, will um, optionally implement. There's only one, one callback that's mandatory, which is the execute, but there are a number of, of callbacks that nodes can, can optionally implement, such as um, overriding the, 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 the filter match evaluation if you, have a, if you need to um, filter nodes based on something more complex than just comparing the 32-bit filter words, then you can actually implement filter matching uh, in, in a function by using the, the matched uh, callback. Um, there are callbacks that you can, that are, that, that are run before and after the actual node execution happens, um, callbacks to handle error conditions, etc. So basically really think about these as, as, as little miniature applications that you can chain together to operate on, on your, 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 your telemetry uh, or measurement um, payloads. We've already covered the processor node registry when we went over sort of the, the, the video overview of how, how STEP works. Um, the, the, the important thing to understand with the registry is that incoming measurements are executed against nodes and node chains in a, a sort of a user-defined priority. So because operating on measurements is a destructive operation, um, there is a mechanism to, to indicate in which order individual nodes or node chains should be evaluated inside the processor node registry. Um, and and you, can, uh, you can enable and disable individual nodes or node chains in the registry at any time or, or add or remove um, nodes or node chains from it. Right, we're, we're out of time, I'm, I'm afraid, like always. Um, but if you have any questions, um, here's, here's some of the ideas we have for future work and feel free to reach out to me um, via email or just on the GitHub repository. Um, and I'd, I'd love to have some feedback on, on sort of the direction that we've been going with this to see what works for you, what doesn't, if you have any suggestions. Um, and again, this is a proof of concept and just kind of testing things out and seeing where this goes. So any sort of feedback and participation is, is very much welcome. So thanks for your time, and I really hope you enjoy the rest of uh, the day, and, and that Lidaro Connect um, has been a, a valuable part of your week. Thanks a lot.